you know, we are relational beings. We desire relationship with others. We, we desire to be known by others and we desire to know others. But our relationships have a way of going south on us. And they go south on us because we're not just relational beings, but we're sinful beings. We're, we're imperfect beings. We're broken beings, and we let one another down. We fail one another, and we hurt one another, and that's our reality. That's the reality that we live in, even within the church. Even as much as we are supposed to be this community that looks like God and acts like God, the reality is, is that at times our sinful nature rears its ugly head, and we hurt each other, we fail each other, we let each other down. And Jesus is well aware of that reality. He knows that it's going to happen, and yet he calls us to be a devoted family, devoted to God and devoted to one another. But how is that possible? How is that possible in a, in a reality in which we hurt each other and let each other down? Well, that's why Jesus gives us these three emergency services for our relationships that we've been looking at. Forgiveness, confrontation, and reconciliation. And you know that second one, confrontation, as I've been going through this, I've been kind of feeling like maybe that wasn't the best word for me to choose. Maybe I should have chose the word correction um, because that's really more of what we're talking about, but that involves confronting. I just almost wonder, I don't want us to lose the importance and the beauty of, of this because a word like confront or confrontation tends to have this connotation that we, we don't like and we just we want to run from. But really, um, anyway, it's, it, it's, what, it's what's there. So these emergency <laughs> services of forgiveness and of con confronting, others or correcting others and reconciling with others are these three emergency services Jesus gives us because he knows we're going to need them. All right? He doesn't give them to us and go, well, you're not really going to need these, but you know, I'm supposed to say this stuff anyway. No, the fact that he teaches us about this tells us that we're going to have to learn how to do this within the Christian community, within the church. It, it's, it's the way that we stay healthy. It's a critical part of our health and community as people, as God's people. And so, um, it's, and it's not just enough, we looked at forgiveness, it's not just enough to forgive somebody when they wrong us. Jesus says we also have to cor confront and correct one another when we wrong each other. That, that we have to call the person to accountability. We have to call our brothers and sisters to repentance. Because sometimes we do things and we don't see how what we're doing is hurtful. Sometimes we know what we're doing is hurtful and we do it anyway. Again, that's that sinful, ugly kind of part of us that tends to spring up every once in a while. But here's the thing about these words from Matthew of Jesus that Pastor Jen read for us, and that is that these are among the most ignored and neglected words of Jesus that Jesus ever spoke. Of all the words Jesus ever spoke, there's lots of his words that we ignore, and there's lots of them that we neglect, but I really wonder if these words are amongst the most neglected, the most um, ignored for us as followers of Jesus. And so here's what I want, to, want you to do. I'm going to give you two minutes. Two minutes, that's all you get. All right, two minutes. Jocelyn, can you set the st stop clock on your phone? All right, or Matt. Two minutes to discuss with two or three others this question. Why do most Christians avoid confronting slash correcting others when they're wronged and sinned against? Okay, two minutes, go. Find two or other, three other people and talk about this question. Okay. All right. Two minutes should be more than enough time to solve the world's problems, right? So, all right. And I, you know what? I sure hope you didn't cheat because there's some of the answers are in your handout. Don't look at them. Don't look at them. Resist. Resist the urge. Okay. So let's just, uh, let's hear from some of you 
Why do most Christians, do you think, avoid confronting and correcting others when they're wronged and sinned against? Okay, so you're worried about hurting someone else's feelings. All right, why else? They, okay, they might not talk to you again. So that's kind of a similar thing. I'll hurt that person's feelings or they might be mad and not talk to me again. What else? Ah, yeah, what happens if you confront somebody and they don't think they're wrong? All right? Other, other thoughts? Yeah, they don't want to accept. So they either they don't think that they're wrong or they will, won't, don't want to accept that they're wrong. Why else? Anything? Okay, avoid arguments, right? Like, I don't like conf confrontation. Anybody up here in this room just don't like confrontation? You just, that just freaks you out. Yeah, I'm with you, brother. I see that hand, right? Yeah, surely. Yeah, some of our temperament. Anybody love confrontation in this room? <laughs> uh, you know, my wife, she loves to confront me all the time. So, oh, it hurts me. Uh, so, any any other thoughts? Oh, okay. So it's like, well, I'm not perfect, and so and so is not perfect. So who am I? To yeah, and you know what? Some that could be one that we can easily self-justify, right? And think, well, you know, I'm not perfect, so I shouldn't point out somebody else's fault. Or we worry, if I do that, they're going to come right back at me with a line just like that, right? Well, who do you think you are to judge me? Are you Mr. or Mrs. Perfect? That you now get to... Any other thoughts on why we avoid this? Okay, so I'm just going to pray about it and it's going to go away, right? So we'll just think, we'll, I'll just deal with it a different way. All right, yeah? Pastor Jen? Okay. Right. So our our we've got we don't have a sense of what healthy boundaries are, mm -hmm. and so therefore we don't live within those healthy boundaries and don't enforce those healthy boundaries. Yeah, I'm sure we could get some more answers. Uh, and all of those things I think are absolutely apply. Let me give you two main reasons, I think, that encompass everything we just talked about, about why we avoid co confronting and correcting other believers. Number one is we're fearful of others. So we t there were some of you mentioned that. Basically, we're afraid of arguments. We're afraid, but really what it comes down to is we're afraid of others. We're afraid of others hurting us more, right? We're afraid that maybe somebody is going to say something that's going to be more hurtful if I confront them, so I'm going to get my feelings hurt, or we're afraid of losing the relationship or further causing tension within the relationship, um, or we so, so badly we want the other person's love and approval in our life that we, so we're afraid. We're afraid, so we don't deal with something because, well, I, just, I don't want to lose a friendship, I don't want to cause more problems, or I just hate confrontation. I hate confrontation, by the way. Um, but I've learned as a pastor that I just have to do it at times. But the other thing is, and this is one I've heard, is just we're cynical of the process. We're truly, many of us are actually very cynical, skeptical that this even works. I remember at one point um, having a conversation around this with another Christian leader. And this person actually said, I'm not lying, I'm not making this up. About Jesus, work, about Jesus' words on this said, that's idealistic, but it doesn't work. That's idealistic, but doesn't work. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you really think Jesus would give us specific instructions that weren't going to work? Jesus says, listen, I'm going to give you some idealistic statements, but by the way, fine print, none of this is going to work. None of this is going to work, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And I'm going to tell you to do it. In fact, I'm going to command you to do this. But it doesn't work. That makes no sense. Now, I, I do want to say this, though, about the cynical piece. 
um, just in one last thought in response to this. Jesus does not guarantee that this will work every time. This is not a silver bullet for your relationships, okay? Jesus doesn't say, just do this, follow these exact instructions, and I guarantee you, your relationships will be resolved and everything will be perfect. He doesn't say that. In fact, the fact that he gives steps and gives quite a severe one in step three indicates that he's guaranteeing it won't always work. But... If we listen to Jesus' words and if we follow what he says here and in the right spirit and the right frame of mind, it can lead to reconciliation and restoration in our relationships. It can. Okay, but if we avoid confrontation, here's what happens. The wrong goes unaddressed and it goes unchecked. The tension is unresolved, so you're going to live with this relational tension. It's going to keep going. The person doesn't change. So if, if the wrong doesn't, if we don't ever address it, and we don't ever point out that, that a certain behavior or something is, is not good, is unhealthy, is unchrist like guess what? The person doesn't change. We don't, help, we don't help the person change. And the relationship doesn't heal. So hurt adds to hurt, right? And that's actually where resentment and bitterness start to form. So, and we're left carrying around the hurt. So that doesn't sound like, is that a good payoff for avoiding confrontation? I don't think those things sound good at all. But that's often what happens. By the way, and let me, let me just say this right up front so we're clear. What Jesus is talking about is confrontation and correction amongst Christians. If you tr- There's principles here that you can live out in your relationships with people that aren't Christians. And... Some of these basic truths can work, can work still, but he is specifically addressing Christian people and their relationship with other Christians. He's addressing really in-house, in the church, this is how we should go about doing things with other believers, okay? That's not to say that these, these truths and principles in, in, a, in a general way don't work with anybody, but he's specifically talking about Christians, and that's important to realize. Okay, now... So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the process really briefly, and then we're going to go back and talk about practicing the process, okay? So let's understand the process Jesus gives us, and then, um, then we'll talk about it a little bit deeper. There are three steps that Jesus gives when it comes to confronting another Christian and correcting an, another Christian. And it's interesting, in my reading, N.T. Wright who some of you may may know, he points out that what Jesus gives is both severely practical, severely practical, and it's ruthlessly idealistic. And he comments and says that's actually the perfect combination because Jesus is being ruthlessly idealistic here about saying, yes, ideally this is how it works and and, and it it will work out, but he's also being severely practical and saying, "Here's here's how this works. Here's how to do this. But it, like we do with all Bible interpretation and understanding, we have to fill in, we have to read between the lines and fill in the gaps a little bit or else we can really miss some key things here. Here's, the, here's step number one, okay? Verse 15 says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. So step one, take the, the matter to the person in private. Sorry, I'm actually, I just realized that, do you have in, in private, right? Okay, so I've got it, I did a little bit wrong on the screen, sorry. So, so your blank is private, right? Take the matter to the person in private, and this avoids some things. It, it avoids, the, if the issue is really between you and them, then you should go to them and it should stay between you and them to start with. And this avoids other people unnecessarily knowing about the other person's sin or wrong. Because you know what? Other people don't need to know. If somebody does something against you, other people don't need to know about that. You need to go and you, you need to deal with it. Because you see, when others do know, a couple things happen. When other people are aware of what somebody's done against you, Meaning, um, maybe like they found out because you've told them or, what, or whatnot. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. 
unnecessarily telling people or about something someone else has done to you, what happens is people tend to gossip about it. So now they're talking about, did you hear what so-and-so did? Can, can you believe that they would act like that, that they, could, that they would do that? Or, so that's one thing, is gossip happens. Secondly, though, people get involved who don't need to get involved, who it's not their place to get involved, and suddenly now you have other people involved in a relational dispute that shouldn't be there giving their opinion. What a mess. What a mess. So Jesus says, if somebody sins against you or wrongs you, go to that person in private. Talk to them privately about it. And if the person listens to your call to correction, and if they repent, guess what? There's restoration. And there's usually an apology. And the relationship can move forward. But here's something that's very important to understand about this step, and that is that this is not ultimately about just about you feeling better, which is what we tend to make this stuff in, into. We think, okay, I'll go and I'll do it, and because I know I'm going to feel better. Well, yeah, you will, and especially if things can be resolved, you'll feel better, but that's not ultimately what this is about. Jesus isn't ultimately concerned about you just feeling better. He's ultimately concerned about the church being healthier and better. So it's not about you feeling better, it's about the church being better. Relationships being better. That's what Jesus is concerned about. So make sure that you're not making this, this about you feeling better, right? It's about the, the community being better. So that's step one. Step two in verse 16 says, but if you're unsuccessful, Take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So step two is basically just step one, except this time you do it in the presence of one or two other Christian witnesses. That's important, right? These are fellow believers that you, you ask. And the presence of these witnesses is meant to do something. See, this is where we got to le- read between the lines, all right, about what the witnesses are for and what they're not for, okay? Here's the first thing. The presence of these witnesses is meant to help the process by providing protection for both people. You know what I I learned in this process? It suddenly really struck me that I thought this was used, I really used to read this, that this was about you take two other people with you who are kind of on your side that are trying to help the other person understand they're wrong because they're not listening. That's not what Jesus says. He doesn't say, go and find two people that agree with you and go and verbally rough the person up. That's not what he says at all. He says, make sure you take one or two other Christian brothers or sisters with you as witnesses. So here's the function of the witnesses, all right? It's to protect you because you then again confront the person and share We've talked about this before, and I've asked so-and-so and and -and so-and-so to come and be part of this so that they can be witnesses to what I'm sharing with you and also how you're responding to me. So they are there to protect the, the, the person who's confronting so that if the person who's being confronted kind of flies off the handle emotionally a little bit, they're able to, to say to the person, no, 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 that's not okay. That's that, your response is not okay. It's not Christ-like you need to do some checking of your heart. You're speaking abusively. You're not being, and if somebody's being really unreasonable, then the witnesses can also say, I don't know if you're being honest about your own heart here, but it's also for the protection of the person who's being confronted. Because sometimes when we confront others, we come in both guns ablazing, right? And we just start, right? And the witnesses can stand and go, ho, 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 ho. This isn't okay. You're speaking abusively. You're speaking arrogantly. And sometimes the witnesses start to recognize the person who's confronting the other person actually has some stuff going on in their own heart that's not okay. And you see, then it's the the person is a third person party who's able to look at the situation and start to listen and recognize what's happening here between these two people. It's not bring along two people who agree with you so that we can gang up and get somebody to admit they're wrong. That's not what Jesus says. That's not the purpose of the witnesses.
the witnesses can help the corrector themselves be corrected and to see if there's, if there's any arrogance, any judgmentalism, any hypocrisy, which they may need to see that they're not seeing. Remember I talked about how we, we only usually see like this? We often don't see our, we don't see all of our hearts. And when someone else is there, sometimes they can point out to us, okay, you may be, have a point here about being wrong, but what you're doing here, or how you're thinking about this, you're, you're not considering the bigger picture here. So witnesses play an important pro, uh, part in this. But the goal of this step, notice, it's still repentance and it's still restoration. That's the point of all this, is for the, is for the relationship to be restored. Not to place blame, you know, not to win arguments. It's that the relationship will be restored. And this further legitimizes the process ultimately going to the formal, the most formal step, which is step three. And here's about what step three is about. Verse 17 says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Okay, now do both the time and the, and the other stuff I want us to focus on here. We're not gonna really go heavy into step three, okay? But here's what you should know anyways about this. If the pers person still refuses to listen, the third step is to bring the matter to the church leadership and the broader church community, if necessary. If someone's still failing to acknowledge they're wrong, if they're still in a pattern of rebellion and saying, and not, I'm, I'm, I don't think I've done anything wrong, if, if they really are not cooperating, then that's when church leadership, that's the point at which church leadership gets involved. Now, this is the, f but see this for what it is and what it's not. This is not meant to be like a judge, jury, executioner type step. It's actually the final plea of the, of the Christian community to come to this person and say, please, please, do you not see what you're doing? Do you not see how it's hurting people? Do you not see how it's destructive? Do you not see how your attitude is, is, is hurting you and it's hurting other people? It's hurting this community. It's really a plea. This is not a, a crackdown as much as it is a plea from the whole community and its leadership to say, please, don't you see? Now, at this point, it's felt, Jesus is saying, at this point, it's felt enough opportunity for repentance has been given. And if this person continues in this pattern of rebellion and, and an unwillingness to admit that what they've been doing is wrong, um, then they're, if, they're, if they're refusing the correction of the whole community, Jesus gives the church leadership basically authority to make decisions when it comes to unrepentant members about disassociating with them. This whole idea of treating them as you would a pagan or a tax collector means it's about disassociation, saying we need to break fellowship with you because what you're doing is hurtful and harmful and you don't recognize it and, and as a result we have to, we have to step away from you and break fellowship with you. Now, there's, like, there's more we could say about that, but again, we're a little bit strapped for time, and that's not really totally the focus of, of this series or the messages this morning. But those are the steps, okay? Now, let's talk about practicing the process. Now, I promised in my um, live video on Facebook that this would be one of the most practical sermons I've ever preached, and I'm going to deliver, okay? So here we go with these questions. There are a series of... Um, okay, first of all, you should deal with these things in a timely manner, Jesus is saying, all right? That you shouldn't let them fester, you shouldn't let them go unresolved, and we, and we need to deal with these matters in person, all right? Um, if, you, if there's a real... Okay, we're also talking about serious offenses here. We're talking about dishonesty. We're talking about when somebody gets, gossips about you. We're talking about... Um, when somebody uh, uh, betrays your trust, okay? Things like that. We're not talking about trivial things, all right? This is, this is talking about when, when the offenses are, are larger, um, and I'll get there in a second, but you don't send text messages, all right? Don't send text messages, Facebook messages, don't deal with this in email, and you do, for those of you who are old school and you would write a letter, don't write a letter. Jesus is saying these are things you need to deal with in person, face to face. You need to sit down. 
Avoid the telephone too. Some things can be done over telephone. Some things. But for the most part, you got to get face to face, Jesus says. Right? Don't take the coward's way out. And it really is a coward's way out, friends. It's cowardly to hide behind text messages, Facebook <laughs> messages, because your little fingers can type anything and send it off. And it's easy. The real courage is found in getting in front of somebody else that you love and care about who's hurt you and working it out. So don't, don't, don't do this stuff except in person. Jesus also teaches us here that this process takes courage and it takes humility. And most of all, if you didn't catch it in the very last verse, he's saying it takes prayer, a lot of prayer, everything bathed in prayer. And the goal of confronting, the goal of correcting another believer is always, it's always, it's always about reconciliation and restoration in the relationship. It's not about winning arguments. If you want to confront people and correct people because you want to win arguments, you're wrong. That's the wrong heart space to work from. It just is. There's a series of questions we should be asking ourselves here. So let's get into them. In the pre-process, there's pre-process questions. Even before you start step one, there's questions you should be asking yourself. And here's, here they are. First of all, has the person committed a legitimate sin or wrong against me? Or am I simply being unrealistic or unreasonable in my expectations? This actually happens, right? At times, we're unreasonable or we're unrealistic in our expectations. Or are we being oversensitive or overdramatic in our response? Or are we being self-absorbed and self-centered in our attitudes? That's an important question to ask. If you feel someone's hurt you, you need to pause and say, no, wait a second, am I really, am I being a drama queen right now about this? Am I making a bigger deal out of this than it really needs to be? Is the offense legitimate, right? Or am I just wound up about something that's really not that important? And maybe I still need to speak to this person about it, but really, I'm making a way bigger deal out of this than it is. Okay, that's an important question to ask. So here's another one. Is this a more serious offense or a more trivial matter? Is this about somebody who has truly lied to you and is being dishonest with you? Somebody, a fellow believer has betrayed your trust or they've gossiped about you. There's other things we could talk about here too that are legitimate, more serious offenses, right? That really, really cause damage in relationships. So you gotta ask yourself this, is like, you know, is this just a trivial thing or do I, is this a real thing that I need to, to deal with here? And have I prayed about this situation? If you haven't even begun to pray, don't even think about step one. Don't do anything to start step one if you haven't started to pray about this. And praying about, uh, praying about a, a, a few different things. First of all, have you prayed about how you're going to handle it? Right? Have you worked, prayed through the first couple questions? Here's the next one. Have I prayed for this person? Am I praying for this person out of love for this person? Have I prayed for myself? Am I praying about my own heart and my own attitude saying, God, I'm feeling hurt right now and I'm feeling like I need to talk to this person, but show me if in my own heart, where if I'm wrong, show that to me. Show me where my attitude may really stink right now. Show me if I'm being self-centered right now. So this is all pre-process stuff, all right? Now, step one questions. Here we go. Asking yourself the question, even as you're, you know, about to do step one and in step one, do I genuinely love this person? Do I have a sense on my heart that I love this person and really care about this person, that I, that I care about this relationship? Which leads to that second one. Do I want to see this relationship restored? Is that my motivation for confronting this person and correcting them? Is because I actually value this relationship and I want this relationship to be healthy and I want it to thrive? Or do I just want to win, the, do I want to win this person or do I want to win the argument? Is this about restoring the relationship or is it about getting an apology and an admission of wrong from someone else? Because that honestly is sometimes our motivation for why we confront fellow believers is that we just want to be right. We want them to admit they were wrong. We just want to win. And Jesus says, 
I'm not interested in winning arguments. I'm interested in winning people. He uses that language as he says, if they listen to you and receive your correction, you've won your brother or sister. You've won them. You've won back the relationship. The focus is always the relationship. And if you have any other goal in why you're correcting somebody because you think it's your place to show him how wrong they are, because sometimes we get that all kind of squirrely and messed up as well, that we, that we actually we try to take on a role, the role of the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. And you're, I hate to break it to you, but you're un- underqualified for the job. So these are important questions in your step one process to be working through. And even when you're in the process, when you're meeting with that person and maybe, maybe they are being unreasonable and you start to feel the anger starting to build because you're like, this person's really not seeing how what they've done is hurtful or this is very frustrating. We have to ask ourselves the question, how does, the, how does God see this person right now? And am I seeing that person through God's eyes right now? Or am I just wanting to blast them So keeping our heart in check in the process is very important. Now, some step two questions. So let's say it didn't work. You've talked to the person. They don't think they're wrong. They're being difficult. They're being unreasonable. They're just saying, no, I don't see a problem here. And, you know, I think you're a jerk. And and, uh, and you're just not in touch with reality. So now you, you bring along your one or two witnesses. Now, Here's a question you should be asking yourself when you're looking at who to take. Who can I take with me that's mature, a mature believer, right? A humble Christian. So not like, the last thing you want to do is take a guns a-blazing person with you. Somebody who's not self-controlled and not very humble. Man, that's just, <laughs> that's just a recipe for disaster. But also, who can I take with me who's mature and wise and humble and is not afraid to speak the truth in love, both to me and the other person? You know who, you know who I'd take? I'd want to take Pastor Jen. Because Pastor Jen is mature and she's wise and she's humble and she's not afraid to speak the truth. Let me tell you, but if you bring Pastor Jen, I'm out. If you bring Pastor Jen to me, <laughs> if you come to confront me and you bring Pastor Jen, I'm out. <laughs> because I know she's going to speak the truth in love and I'm a goner. I'm not, I'm not really going to run away. Just make it a joke. You want to take people with you who you know have wisdom and have humility in their own heart, have grace working in their own heart, who have the love of God working in their own heart and aren't afraid to speak the truth but know how to do it in love. You need to take wise people that's setting yourself up much better. So that even if the situation doesn't work out, so even if you follow these steps, even if the person doesn't listen, even if they don't receive correction, guess what? You have a clear conscience and you haven't inflicted any further damage because you yourself are in the right heart space and you've brought the right kind of people along with you. Here's another question then about step two. Be sure to take witnesses who the other person respects and who aren't simply your friends because that looks like a loaded panel, doesn't it? When all you bring along is your friends, like within the church community, the people that you know, for, and, no, and nobody who maybe is also a common friend with that person or is respected by that person, guess what? You're, now it looks like you're just bringing people with ammunition, So you want to make sure that whoever you bring with you as a witness is somebody the other person respects, who's wise and, you know, and respected in the other person's eyes. That's just common sense. And then also asking this question, am I ready to receive the correction of these witnesses if I'm wrong in my attitude and my behavior? So if I take Pastor Jen along with me, I got to recognize, I got to be ready to receive any correction that she's got to give me to receive any insight she's giving me saying, Pastor Mark, I understand you're upset about this and you know that's legitimate, but the way you're handling this isn't very good and, and you, need to, you need to be checking your own heart about this and about, am I prepared to do, see, because see, if all you want to do is win the argument, you're not going to be ready to receive that. You're just going to be wound up even more if the witnesses you bring 
speak any type of correction towards you. You're going to be like, what? I, suddenly this is about me? This is about them. Right? That's what tends to happen when we're not in touch with what's going on in our own heart and we're not ourselves humble. Friends, you know why this often doesn't work? Because we don't go in, into it with the right heart space. Our hearts aren't ready to do it. We haven't, so let me ask you a question. Have, if you're going to do this, you have to say, have I genuinely forgiven this person? Or am I still, still bitter? Am I still resentful? Am I still holding a grudge? Guess what? If that's how you feel, you're not ready to have the conversation. You've got to be able to go into that conversation in step one, when it's just the two of you, knowing that I've already settled this in my heart. God and I have already dealt with this. I've forgiven the person, but I still need to point out a wrong here. Correction still needs to happen. But it usually doesn't work because we're still mad and we haven't forgiven the person. You're, there, it's just going to blow up. Kaboom. Or um, it's about being right, not about winning the person. Kaboom. Wait for a blow up. Right? You bring the wrong people with you. Kaboom. If you even get that far. Blow up. So the reason why this often doesn't work is because we don't do it right. It's just that simple. We get this wrong in our process and we get it wrong in our own hearts. We haven't done the pre-process work and so guess what? Kaboom. That's why it doesn't work. It can work. And Jesus says, oftentimes it will work. Many times it won't. Many times you may get to step three. It, it, may, it may happen. That's why he gives us three steps <laughs> because sometimes it gets to step three. But he says, listen, if you do this in the right way and in the right spirit, and if you follow these instructions, and if you get the right people with you, my spirit's going to work here. My spirit's going to work here. Give me space to do it. And make sure that your heart is in the same space as my heart. And that leads to this last part of it, friends. Every act of confrontation and correction should be bathed in prayer and should be rooted in the experience of the gospel. So you should be praying before you do this. You should be praying all throughout this. And also, you should be drawing upon your own experience of the gospel because let me ask you a question. How has... God dealt with you. You see, when the Holy Spirit confronts us, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, how does he do it? Does he do it in condemnation? Does he do it with a big wagging finger? Does he do it in a, in a violent, abusive, verbal way? No, you know what this, the Holy Spirit does? You know how the gospel works? It does a surgical strike on our heart. The Holy Spirit brought your sin and my sin to our attention and said, you're wrong, but I love you. You're wrong and your sin has caused damage to you and it's caused damage to others, but guess what? I shouldered that. I took that upon myself. I went to the cross. I dealt with that. Jesus, when he confronts us about our sin, he points to the, to the cross. He says, this is how much it cost to deal with your sin. This is how serious your sin is, but this is how much I love you. That I'll go to the absolute furthest extent. I'll bear the ultimate cost in order to bear your sin and to bring you back to me. See, Jesus, what is he concerned about? He's not concerned about winning arguments. He's concerned about winning you. He's concerned about winning me. And that's how he does it. It's, see, the cross is the perfect picture of the truth spoken in love. That we're sinners. That we need to repent. And see, friends, when that lies at the heart of your confrontation, when you know you're in the same boat as that other person, and when you remember, how's God dealt with me? Suddenly it puts you in the right heart space to approach them. So you shouldn't do it without a lot of prayer and you shouldn't do it until you have once again let the grace of God in on your own heart to remind you 
of how God has confronted and corrected you. Do you know how to do that? Have you done that? You have a, a couple things on the end of your sheet there. You have a prayer, which is something that's just meant to be a, a help to you as you begin to pray through this in your own life. Because if there's somebody that right now in your own life that you need to confront, somebody that, um, that, that has wronged you and you need to deal with that, then that's a prayer to get you started. But also there's two other things there is to think about what's your big takeaway from today? What's your big takeaway from today? What has God really said to you? And then what action steps do you need to take? What action steps do you need to take? Let the grace of Jesus and the way he has so lovingly corrected and handled you, let that lead you into how you correct and confront your brothers and sisters because, friends, we're family. Jesus cares about this family. He cares that we're healthy. And at times, it means we got to hold each other accountable. Sometimes we're wrong, and we need to be told we're wrong, and we need to admit we're wrong and repent of the wrong. And the grace of Jesus is big enough to lead us into that, and it's big enough to lead us through that, and it's big enough to give us, give us victory and to keep his family together even when it looks like it might just blow apart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you so lovingly handle us, and yet you do it in such a way that you never lose sight of the truth. You always keep the truth in front of us, but like a loving parent, you say, don't you see how this is hurting you? Don't you see how you're hurting others? Don't you see how this grieves my heart? And Lord, we need to learn from you in that regard. We need to let that truth in. We need that to shine and shed light on everything we do when it comes to our relationships with each other. So I pray today that you will help me, that you will help us to be people who are rooted in your grace and in your love. But may we not ever turn a blind eye to sin. May we not say sin is okay, because it's not. You say it's not. You never said our sin was okay. So we can't say that the sins of others, when their significant offenses are okay. We must never say that. But we need to learn how to do this right, and I admit I need to grow in this, we need to grow in this. So help us, Holy Spirit, today to grow in this. And if, if there's any of us in this room that need to take steps with each other about some wrong that we have uh, experienced and suffered, May you give us the grace to do it. May we follow the wisdom of your son, Jesus, who lays it out so practically here. And may we hold to the ideal that he gives us as well, that we can get past these things and that, we, that, that, that this will work when we do it the right way. Maybe not a guarantee every time, but that you promise you're gonna work. And if we would just unite our hearts as we're doing right now in prayer around it, that you are among us and that your presence in the context of that conversation is the thing that's going to bring it all back together. We thank you for your healing power in our lives and in our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, um, this, is, you know, this is tough stuff. I never said it's easy, but we need this kind of relationship 911. We just, we need it. And Jesus gives it to us. And he doesn't just tell us what to do. He shows us what to do because he did it on the cross for us.